Well, actually, you're about NoSQL, <laughs> <laughs> right? So I got all of you. Um, I don't have much to add to the next speaker. He gives us a very nice overview of all the things we hear after his talk is done, but it'll be a very good introduction. It's a great pleasure to introduce Matthias Meyer. Thanks. Give him a hand. Okay, so my talk's title is No NoSQL, The Definitive Guide. What I want to do today is give you like a whirlwind tour of what the technology is all about and what the tools are all about. And it's going to be a really fast one. If you have questions, uh, you can always come up to me uh, after that. Uh, who am I? My name is Matthias Meyer. I, I carry the fancy title of Chief Visionary at a company called Peritor here in Berlin. Uh, I play a lot of with clouds, uh, Amazon's EC2, Ruby, and NoSQL databases. I, I tweet and I write a lot of code. And uh, what I do for, well for a living basically is build this, uh, this tool called Scalarium. It's an awesome cloud management and deployment platform. And I want to say a little disclaimer. I, I'm just a user. I am, I'm not here to talk about any of the tools uh, in specific. I'm just, uh, I'm just want to give you an idea. And I just like to play with them and I work with them. That is what I, what I have to do with NoSQL. And I blame a couple of people for me being here. One is this guy. He's sitting right in front here. He's uh, one of the committers of CouchDB, Jan Lenhardt. And the other guy is uh, Salvatore Sanfilippo. He's the author of Redis, uh, another awesome tool I've grown very fond of. And yeah, I just blame these people for me being here because they like kind of infected me with uh, really playing and working with that stuff. What is NoSQL? It's a weird word that's, uh, that's pretty much a given. And uh, it leaves a lot to imagination. First off, is it about having no NoSQL? It is not really. It is... Uh, there, there's been a couple of other terms uh, like less less SQL or not only SQL or even post relational, and for me they're all pretty meh because we're not talking about new technologies uh, basically. It's like we're talking about more of an evolution. They just the technologies comes in a prettier package by now, and I'm gonna go into uh, into good detail about that. What NoSQL is really about. And this is the part where it gets opinionated. This is my view of the NoSQL world. If you're talking probably to a lot of other guys, they will te uh, tell you a different idea. But um, at l I know that a lot of ideas I'm going to be talking about today are at least shared by, uh, by other people. So I think uh, you're good in e either way. The first and for me most important thing is that it's about simplicity. It's um, relational databases as we're working with uh, today they love imposing constraints on us. They love imposing constraints uh, on our data. And constraints, has, uh, constraints have the nice side effect of slowing down. Not just performance, if you ever had to build an index on a My MySQL table with a couple of million entries, you pretty much know what I'm talking about. Um, it also slows down, it slows down development. I'm not very flexible with my schema. I always have to take care of my schema. And I'm kind of a lazy guy. I, don't li I like to take care of my schema, but I, I don't like... Uh, like to have that constraint imposed on me by my database. Simplicity is about removing these constraints, about giving me giving me the tools to do what I want with my data, and it doesn't reinvent the wheel. Uh, the wheel because that's what that's kind of very important to me. Uh, the tools we're talking about they're not exactly new. They're just combinations of new technology, like forged into new kind of awesome products, but. Uh, they're not. They're not trying to to build everything from scratch. Data, and that is, NoSQL is for me is about data. And that question I was asked, why? Why is it about data? What is what is your point with data? Because relational databases are also about data, obviously, because I'm storing data in them. It's about having different use cases, and different use cases require different data structures. In relational databases, I only have one data structure. I only have tables, and I have to fit my data. I have to rework my data somehow to fit in tables. And in the end, well, depending on my scale, I always ended up with uh, denormalizing my data, and kind of weird for a relational database. Uh, but if you look at what Reddit di did, what uh, Dig did, what a lot, of a lot of other companies did was in the end, they built somewhat of a NoSQL database on top of a relational database. And to me, that just doesn't really make sense, although you could obviously do it. It's NoSQL no for me, the biggest tagline is, it is about 
to using what's right for your data, even if that's a relational database. I'm not excluding relational database from the world of, uh, of databases now, just because I'm talking about NoSQL. It's about using what your particular use case, uh, uh, what your particular use case requires. You just pick the right data structure for that, and that is somewhat of the essence for me. Oh, and then the best part, which is basically why we're uh, why we're all here, uh, scalability. But it's kind of not that big point for me. I gotta say, I'm um, I'm more about the other things than about scalability. Scalability is a nice thing I get on the side by simplicity and um, having uh, having simple data structures. It's obviously about handling ginormous amounts of data. Um, there's going to be a lot more talks on that today. I'm not going to be I'm not going to be talking about stuff on the larger scale really. I'm just going to be talking about NoSQL and uh, and data. Data is awesome. It's about simpler ways to scale up. Relational databases are kind of weird uh, when it comes to scaling up and probably a lot of you know that and I'm going to go into a lot more detail on that later. It's about diversity. It's about as I already said you're going you're supposed to pick was right for your data. And that doesn't necessarily mean you're just supposed to pick one tool. You pick whichever tool is right for your particular use case. And that is what diversity for me is all about. Relational databases really try to fit all sizes. And I, I don't know about you, but I, but I always found they did a rather bad job at that. And a disclaimer, I haven't just worked with my MySQL in my, in my time. I've worked with a lot of uh, relational databases. And it just never wasn't any fun to work with them. I just and working with the even working with tools, it should be somewhat fun. And my favorite quote is this: "It is 20 years old. Its database research has produced a number of good results, but the relational database is not one of them." That is 20 years ago. Think about that. Some guy wrote that to the uh, to the ACM forum back then because uh, it was a time when people started writing a lot about relational databases, and yeah, that's uh, this one. This is a link, and you can read the whole letter. And I would highly recommend it because it's basically, it basically describes to me everything that NoSQL is all about. The fun started when relational databases met the web. Yeah, <laughs> this is a WordPress schema. It's really good fun to to look at. I really like it. It's it's not even complex, but still, it's already heavily denormalized, which is. Uh, kind of ironic to me. Uh, does, uh, the web is kind of, it didn't need more structure to me. It quite the opposite, quite the opposite of that. It needed less structure. I wanted my data to, well, to be whatever I want. I think in the earlier talk today, someone said that 80% of the data we, um, we produce is unstructured. Was that right? Awesome, yeah. And that is pretty much my point. Uh, what I'm producing in data is, I think I like to think more of that in documents. They're pretty loosely structured, and I don't have I don't have a particular schema uh, I want to I want to have my documents in. They're loosely structured. It's kind of the the what schemaless uh, in the end was uh, was supposed to be, but schemaless is kind of a weird term to me as well. I like to describe it in uh, in documents, but schemaless is about having no constraints and about uh, being very flexible about your data model. So it still fits perfectly for uh, to have less structure. And simple data access. I don't want to. I'm not a fan of SQL. I gotta say, it's, uh, it was always mind-bending to me. I have tried, but in the end, we've never become friends. Uh, less structure. This is what less structure is to me. It is. Uh, I gotta say, it's upfront. It's a CouchDB document, but uh, it's it's just uh, it's just a stand-in. It's a stand-in for a document. It's a stand-in for schemaless and for JSON, because if anything, no SQL loves JSON, or anything that is somewhat JSON-related. Why is that? JSON is a very is a very simple data format, and it brings a couple of uh, a couple of data structures that are just well you will find in most databases, and that are usually good enough to describe all of your data. And it's pretty universal. You can parse it in any in any programming language, and you can basically it's just a a, a giant hash, and it's a fun data structure to work with. It's not the optimum, and it's not the only data structure. Uh, that is uh, that is suitable for that kind of stuff. It's just somehow it just it has emerged as something uh, that people just love to use. Even though Werner Vogels from Amazon doesn't really like it. Um, simple data access. It's again it's a CouchDB example. I gotta say it's but it's uh, it's 
it's a good example for simplicity. Basically, I just have a giant ID, which looks kind of weird. It could be a number if you wanted to, but at the end, I've, I've gotten pretty used to using these ID, uh, IDs. And you just have, basically, it's just a key value access. You use a key and get back or either a JSON or whatever structure you have in your database. But simple data ac access is it's kind of weird to explain because you could always say that in relational databases, I can always get my data with just a primary key. But to me, it's just it's just not the same, and I'm I have kind of a hard time coming up with a good reason for that. It just it's uh, it's you get you'll get a lot clearer picture when I when I'm going to be talking about scaling, and it makes a lot more sense to have simpler data access because it just makes exactly that simpler scaling up, and that's in the end what everyone wants uh, likes to do. And why we're all here, <laughs> we like to scale up. Scaling up wasn't really a big issue before today's web. It was we sure we had big installations and we had giant databases run on mainframes, but we had like there were a lot of well new new boundaries we had to work with like g uh, databases across different uh, different data centers and stuff like that or. What what Jan loves talking about the offline uh, offline web, you know, when you're you're just you're anywhere and you want to work with your database and you want just a bit later when you get back online, you just want you you want your data to get back on the web. The <sighs> classification it's just the the first part was merely a, a small introduction and the, um, there's been a couple of tools that has em uh, that have emerged and a couple of. Um, well, a couple of different different categories. These tools somehow tried well were put in because people love putting um, putting their tools into different categories. And I'm going to try to do well a simple classification because one NoSQL database isn't like the other. They're all somewhat different, but they're all somewhat strangely similar, which is kind of fun. We have four contestants in the categories. We have key value stores, we have document databases, and column stores, and graph databases, and all these databases, well, except for key value stores, I think, are somewhat represented at this conference, and I would highly suggest g going to all these talks to get more detail on that uh, on these kind of tools because I won't go into a lot of detail on them. I would just just merely give you an idea, but there's going to be a lot of talk on them, and I would really recommend checking them out. Key value stores, they're basically what I what I just said. They're the simplest thing you could probably pro uh, probably imagine. You just have a key and you have a value, and you just use the keys to look up that data, and that's pretty much it. A key value store can do. It's kind of mind boggling because you know that it's always a question: what what can you do with that simple access? You can do a lot of things with it. What you can do is query query for any data with a key value store. I'm going to try and to do something more historical to really give you an idea that uh, we're not talking about new technology here. It's uh, there is a tool called Berkeley DB that was built in 1991 that basically did just that. It was you got a, you had a key. It was an embedded database engine, and you could store your data as a serialized array. And it's still in use today. And apparently, it can handle up to 265 uh, terabytes of data in one database. So that's that was pretty amazing to me to realize that, and it's still an active use even by tools uh, that are built today, uh, m modern modern NoSQL tools. What you would find today is Project Voldemort, for example, Tokyo or Kyoto Cabinet. The author of these tools is quite weird. He likes to build one tool, leave it on the side, and then build a new tool. And you have Redis and. Amazon's S3 is probably the best example for any key value store that a lot of people probably already have used. It's a pretty awesome tool, and I really love using it. And the the final one of the one of the final contestants is Scalaris. There is a lot more of these tools. I'm just giving you five examples. It's pretty. It's become pretty much hip to write your own key value store. Um, but these are pretty much in widespread use. At least, well. I'm not. I'm not exactly sure about Scalaris, to be honest. Um, um, but um, the f the former four are in are in effective use. Bec I know because I'm using at least two of them, and I know of a lot of uh, a lot of other companies using them. The next contestant, document databases. You have 
Well, the example basically I already gave you. You have JS you have uh, pretty rich documents. They're self-contained. They don't have a. They don't have a. Uh, they don't have a strict structure. You could. They could have any kind of data. They could have any attributes, any value. It's it's up to you. They're probably the most versatile of all th uh, of all of these tools. And you can do queries on your data with JavaScript and Map uh, MapReduce kind of stuff. It kind of has emerged as a way to do that in document databases, but. Um, if you think back in the mid '90s, there were XML databases. Um, I have no idea who actually used them, but um, they are somewhat they are somewhat similar. They are also document databases, and but you would use, for example, XPath to access your data. And if anyone has used XPath, it's really not it's really not fun to use. And yeah, this is pretty much the same example as uh, as I already gave you earlier. This is this is an example document. This is what a document would look like in CouchDB, but it could be it could be anything that you could fit a loose data structure in. XML, for example, but I didn't want to show you XML because it's that is very 90s. Ah, Lotus Notes, the first uh, real document databases uh, humankind has ever used. <coughs> Built in uh, 1989. These years are probably estimates and what I could find on the internet, but it's as you can see, it's very old. But it's still on the bags you you get at the conference. <coughs> but it was document oriented. It was you can have you and that was you know what everyone will tell you about Lotus Notes. What was amazing, you could stuff any data in your Lotus Notes databases. That is pretty awesome. And it had offline replication. You could take your laptop anywhere, work in your Lotus Notes, and when you get back online, it would sync up your data. It's unfortunately still in use. Any if any one of you has uh, really used Lotus Notes, you 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 understand why I write. Unfortunately, <coughs> what do we have today? W today we have CouchDB, we have React, and we have uh, MongoDB. But we also still have XML databases, unfortunately too. But um, apparently there's still a use for them. Yeah, what can you say? Uh, CouchDB is Lotus Notes on steroids, and I really like I really like telling people uh, about that because. It is the best example for an an kind of old technology that has been well that has been equipped with new technology and turned um, turned into something awesome. You have like a couple of a couple of Lotus Notes technologies. It is offline by default. You can sync up to any to any other CouchDB database, and you end up with uh, like a P2P peer to peer like replication. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because the next talk will be on CouchDB, but there's also React. Which is pretty much uh, it is pretty similar uh, to CouchDB in the in the core, but it follows a very different model of scaling. A model uh, of in yeah I'll be talking about later. Column databases there are the most uh, mind-boggling databases to me because they're they're very much about storing similar data at one p in one in one particular point. There's going to be a talk on Cassandra tomorrow, and I highly recommend checking it out. I should be there. Um, similar data is stored together, and the difference there's a weird difference to uh, relational databases. Um, you access your data directly by key and an attribute, and that is incredibly fast. If you have a if you look at a traditional column in uh, I in a relational database, this is usually what you have, and you would end up looking for the ID and then go to the row and fetch the data. In a column databases, in a column database, this is what basically what a column would look like. It's basically a hash, but you can access that hash by the key and the name, and that that access won't go. I it just won't go through to first fetching the column and then the attribute. It will do that in one step, and that is incredibly fast and has the the nice well the nice side effect of being nicely scalable. <coughs> the, the best example, uh, the the earliest example I could find was Sybase IQ. It was built in 1996. So once again, we're not talking about a new technology here. It is like a technology that has had a place for in business analytics for about 15 years already, and apparently it can handle it. Sybase IQ in 2007 they did um, they did a kind of a test and it handled the largest database of business analytics data, which was about one petabyte. Probably by now Facebook already has suppressed that, but back then hmm? back then it was a pretty big deal, as you can imagine. Back then, there almost was no Facebook. What do we have today? The best contestants today, and probably the most well-known, are Google's Big Table. 
it is not exactly the same as, for example, Cassandra, but it was it's kind of the inspiration for all of that. And yeah, and you have HBase and Hypertable. And I just want to go into I just wanted to scratch uh, Cassandra because Cassandra is a mix of Bigtable and Dynamo. I'm gonna be uh, I'm gonna be going into a bit more detail on Dynamo in a moment, but yeah, it basically takes the scaling model of Dynamo and the data model of Bigtable and well, in a warm and loving embrace, if you will. And it supports a lot of other fancy stuff. Uh, really, highly recommended to go to the uh, to the talk tomorrow to get a lot more details because some of it is really it's really mind blowing. I gotta really say, the last contestant, graph databases. Graph databases they're allowed to store very very large networks or trees of data, and to traversal of that uh, of that graph and that tree is very cheap because, well, there's going to be a Neo 4 J talk to, uh, today later on. But uh, the gist is, traversing the tree is so cheap um, because the data is, is just stored in a way that allows for that. And basically, it's very easy to, to just dump uh, whole trees or graphs of objects in the graph database and just let it take care of, uh, of, uh, of storing all your associations. And it's you just don't have to do any nested queries to, to get to your stuff in a graph database. You, just you, can, walk, you can walk from association to association or you can do fancy queries on that. And yeah, this is this is what it could look like. This is the internet somewhere around 2000, I think. It's probably a lot bigger than that, but just this is basically a kind of a kind of graph that you could store in a graph database. <laughs> and yeah, the earliest one I could think of was this one. It's not exactly a, a graph database, but it's this kind of a thoughtful pre a predecessor to, to graph databases. is an object database. You had like something like trans, uh, transparent object persistent. You could just take a Java object or a C++ object. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, Java and C++. Uh, you could just take any object and, st and dump it in the database and it would just take care of you, uh, take care of serializing uh, attributes and object associations for you. I've had the pleasure of working with that database. So it was pretty good fun. But it's pretty easy to store and traverse millions of objects. And that's basically the same what, for example, these tools are about. Maybe not core data. Core data is shipped with uh, Mac OS X. It is a persistence framework. And in some way, it is, a, it is a graph database, as amazing as it sounds. And obviously, the most, the most popular player today is Neo4j, but also HypergraphDB. There's a lot more tools to that, but these are just a couple of examples who, uh, which I could find were in active use. And Neo4j is, well, it's, it used to be an embedded engine. By now, they also have um, a, restful, a RESTful service, I think. And the data is somewhat semi-structured. So you go, you're go basically going away from the, mo from the model of having closed objects, like an object databases. Your data is very flexible. It just You can think of it as a document database, basically, that has a very, a very nice way of, uh, of traversing your data. And apparently, it's very easy to store hundreds of millions of objects with Neo4j and walk them back. The categories I was talking about, they overlap in some cases. A uh, document database can be a key value store, and a lot of people use it like that. This is why I mentioned the key value access, because it's still the same in a document database. A column store is just a fancy key value store, but it is really fancy. A graph And a graph database, basically, this today is a document database in steroids, but I'm really on a lot of steroids, basically. And some document databases ha can handle graphs. For example, React uh, has somewhat built-in support to, to, have, to have links between documents, and you can fetch them on one go. It's pretty awesome, and makes React kind of unique in the world of document databases. The funnest part, scaling out. There's two pretty common models of relational databases you would find in real life, and one is to have a master slave set up and with an obvious bottleneck up at the top, all the basically all your writes go to to the master and all the reads go to the slaves. And if your master goes down, all you can do is read data, which is okay in in some cases, but it's basically it's probably not what you want. The other one is charting, but charting in a way that your client uh, did some some consistent hashing algorithm or just knew how, how your data is partitioned and just would go to the correct chart. And in some way, it's just not, 
just not great ways of um, of scaling out, if you ask me. But charting was pr has gotten pretty popular. For example, at Flickr, they they did that pretty early on. They just started spreading out their data, partitioning it by some key, partitioning it across across charts, and accessing data as they want. The problem is you can you couldn't do any joins on charted uh, on charted data, and somewhat somewhat started defeating the purpose of having a relational database. Some no NoSQL approach, I'm not going to be talking about all of them because there are a lot. I'm just going to talk about what, what some, way uh, some way or the other has become very popular and you will some stuff you will find in tools that are going to be talked about today and tomorrow. This is pretty much my favorite. It is, if you will, the peer-to-peer -peer web. And Jan is a very big fan of the peer-to-peer -peer web, and I'm a very big fan of the peer-to-peer -peer -peer web myself. Basically, any database can talk to any database. You can. This is the CouchDB replication model. You can take any database and another CouchDB database and have them replicate each other. And no matter how 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 different their data is, you would probably end up with th some conflicts in the end. But you could so you could replicate any database to any database, and that is. I think it's pretty unique to CouchDB, and it's yeah. It's pretty amazing, I gotta say. And the funnest part, Amazon's Dynamo, which you will find in at least Cassandra or in React, um, you have a ring, which is basically a fancy version uh, of, of sharding, if you will. Your data is, uh, your data is partitioned into some slices. Uh, it looks like yeah, pizza slices. Um, you partition it by some key, by any key you basically want, any key that is suitable. In this case, it's just, a prime just an ID. It could be the range could be from could be millions. The range could be just one to a thousand. It is pretty much up to you. The the gist is you slice up your data in equal in equally sized partitions. That data can be replicated. You have, uh, for example, one partition one partition of your data that is replicated on at least three nodes. The number uh, the the thing to look for is that n up there. You have n nodes. Just uh, get to that in a minute, and you can go to every to every uh, to every node in the cluster to get any key, and that is where it gets different to classic sharding. You can ask any node for any data, even though you know that node doesn't have that data. So basically, what you don't have to do is to care about how m which nodes you have in the cluster, and that is pretty awesome about that. You can go to any node and ask for any data. It's a pretty nice way to scale up, if you ask me. Um, Dynamo is also about ensuring data consistency. Is you have rights that go to you can tell you can tell the ring, I want my rights to go to at least uh, W replicas, and you want to have your reads coming from at least R replicas, and that uh, either way determines if the operation was successful or not. If you can read the same data from uh, from from three different replicas, it is a successful read, and the N, the R, and the W are called the quorum. and it's kind of weird weird mathematical thing, and I tried to come up with some definition of it. If you have three rep replica nodes uh, in the system, or y even if you have four, and you see you're saying, I only want three nodes to have that successful write. That is the quorum. The you know, when, when, all these, uh, when these three replicas come back and say that, that read or write was successful, it is good. Never mind if the, if the fourth node will gonna have the data later, because that's where the next stuff uh, brought to you by Amazon comes in, eventual consistency. It is, uh, it is also, if you if you handled with my 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 SQL replication, you they were rather they were not very open about the fact that it is actually something so like re eventual consistency because what it is about the storage system guarantees that if no new updates are made to the object, eventually all accesses will return the return the last updated value. So imagine back to the ring, you have four replicas and you just need three of them to have a successful write. At some point, even the fourth node will return that value you wrote. But it doesn't have to be right now. It doesn't have to. It, it might. It can be at any point. Usually, you would obviously expect that it's within milliseconds, and obvious. Usually, that will always uh, would be the case. But you're accepting. You're accepting that the write could be that you, the next successful read could be a little bit later. That is basically what Amazon built all of their tools on. EC2, S3, SimpleDB, all of their stuff sort of is based on the idea of eventual consistency, and CouchDB is based on that idea. React is based on that idea. Any, any, uh, any storage you'll probably find that doesn't have, that doesn't really work around distributed transactions, which it really shouldn't, um, 
is somewhat based on the idea of eventual consistency. Why would you pick Dynamo for your database? Because all all of these, uh, most of most of these, except a graph database, is column stores, key value stores, and document databases. They all access their data by key. And if you just need a key to access your data, you suddenly suddenly everything becomes very partitioning friendly. You can you can take that key, put a ha you know, run a hash function on it, and and could go to could find out any partition uh, could find out the partition that key is in. That's why Dynamo has become really somewhat popular and. Well, I don't want to say the choice of the NoSQL generation, but in that you will find it, you will find it in a lot of tools. Cassandra and React are just the mo the more popular examples of that. And these are just two approaches to scaling out. I'm not I'm not implying these are the perfect ones or that they're just the two only ones. They're just the ones you will find a lot. The peer-to-peer -peer one when you're working with CouchDB and the Amazon Dynamo uh, the Amazon Dynamo scaling model, you will find that in a lot of other stores. The funny, the fun question is, and I was talking about that earlier. We don't have the technologies aren't really new. How is today different from back then? You know, why is why do we need different tools today? Couple of the simple, the, the simplicity in the tools isn't really new. Lotus Notes, in some way or the other, for example, was already simple too, but maybe maybe not great. For me, data is what's become important. It's all about my data, and that's what's awesome. You know, I'm I'm free to use any tool um, that just is just the right fit for my data. And the simpler ways to scale out, obviously, there it's not it's not that important to me to really have awesome ways to scale out. But I really, I really enjoy playing with the technologies that have emerged uh, for scaling out, and I really love yeah playing and working with that. But it's it's more about data and simplicity for me because these are like my my personal development models. The evolution is around data and access patterns. It's before you pick it a before you pick a database, you're supposed to think about you. You start more thinking about what kind of data do I have in my database and how do I access the data. And when I'm saying access, I obviously mean how do I query my data. And you would probably you, there were cases where you where you would find out I need a good I need a good amount of dynamic queries and a NoSQL database is maybe not a good fit. But it forces you to think about that, and you should do that anyway. But with relational databases, it was somewhat easier. You just you just had a relational model. You knew your data would somewhat end up uh, in a table or in multiple tables, and in the end, you would end up denormalizing your data anyway because otherwise, it doesn't scale up very well. Open web technologies are not just awesome; they're a pretty good fit for that. That's you, you saw a lot of JSON and JavaScript and HTTP in the, in the talk today, and uh, that's. Somehow they have just emerged. They're they're proven technologies, and they just made a perfect fit to be embedded in a database or as protocols the database could use to talk to. I love I love textual protocols. I hate kind of hate binary protocols. I gotta say, and I love playing with databases where I can use just use curl to to access or play with my data. It's very geeky, I know, but what are you gonna do? If anyone would n these days would try to sell you a closed product, I can only recommend one thing: is just to run because it's not just about getting your data in; it's about getting your data. It's about, for example, getting your data out. I'm not saying you're going to flee to another database later on, but it's it's about the ease that you can you can handle any kind of your data in any way you want. And closed products somewhat have have the the tendency to. Uh, to make that to make that stuff a lot harder. If you have used uh, Amazon SimpleDB at any point, you pretty much know what I'm talking about. Even though it you could count it as a as a contestant in the NoSQL world, it's just not a great tool. NoSQL isn't the holy grail, and that is very important. That is kind of very important to me. It is not. I'm not saying to anyone that he should you definitely go use a, a, a NoSQL database for his next project. If you love playing, if you love living on the edge. Sure, why not? There's a couple of things you just can't you just can't do really nicely. Range queries can be kind of hard, especially when you're talking about a larger scale. When you have when you have a good ring, it becomes harder and harder to do to do more complex range queries. And that is one example, for example, in CouchDB that can get kind of weird. It's just that's just what it felt to me uh, to do range queries in CouchDB. It's kind of awkward, but it is possible. But yeah, it's 
it boils down to the fact if are you willing to deal with that awkwardness or do you just want to do it with the, the classic way of your relational database? Ad hoc queries, and that is the kind of the, the, the most important thing. There is no, there's almost no database where you can do fancy ad hoc queries for, you know, if your boss comes to you and you, you need some fancy business analytics uh, report, that gets very hard with the NoSQL. With the only database I could think of you could do that with is probably SimpleDB, but only in a very restrictive manner. Okay, <laughs> if you count Lucene amongst those, then you could probably do that. That is true. You don't have any transactions. In the end, I don't know a lot of cases where you would end up you needing transactions. It is just a very important thing to know. You just, if you have multiple operations you need to have in one go, it's very unlikely uh, or that that need to be that you need to be atomic. It is very unlikely that you would end up u using a NoSQL database because that too, it just transactions don't scale well in a distributed system. If you ever used a distributed transaction, for example, in the uh, J2EE world, it's just not fun. The question in the end is if I if I if I went through all of that if I went through the process of analyzing my data and looking at my access patterns and how in the end would I uh, would I pick the right tool for my job Of course I can tell you the universal answer for that I can um I won't I wouldn't in any way imply that I knew the answer to that because it depends it always does It depends on data structure do you, do you just have simple data? Do you need it easy, easy to be scaled out? Then you're probably fine with a key value store or a column store, depending on if you have a slightly more complex data model. Column store is probably a good, good idea. If you just have simple data trimmed for fast access, my favorite tool to do that is Redis. You can use MongoDB for that because uh, that is uh, a, good, a good part that MongoDB does well too. Or basically any kind of simple uh, key value store. If you need richer data models, you would probably end up with a document database. And for me, document databases are pretty much, well, they're the most universal of all the four contestants. They have, they just have pretty, pretty good use. You can, you can put a lot of data in a, in a document, but also, uh, obviously, that still comes with some caveats. But I can, I can mostly think of a lot of uses that a document database is a good fit. And you can use a graph database. Read whether write patterns. I'm not going uh, into a lot, a lot of detail because in the end, you need to play with the tools. You need to play with them. You need to work with them. You need to stuff the data you have in them, and you need to find out if if they scale up er, in your uh, in the demand you probably you're expecting, which is probably always not the greatest idea. But if you just access documents by a key, you can use a key value store. You can use a document database. If you just access objects by more complex queries, you can. You again, you use a doc document database, but you need just the same ca the same caveat is true. You can't do any ad hoc queries. You have to you have to know how you query your data, and you have to define the queries in, for example, JavaScript or uh, the XPath. You can probably do ad hoc queries in XPath, but who would want to do that? Uh, or you use a graph database. For example, Neo4j has uh, I think it uses RDF to uh, to do fa to do fancier query stuff. And that is pretty nice. It looks a bit awkward, I gotta say, but at least you can you can query your your network of objects at any time. It is really cheap. And just to give you a particular example, because I love talking about it, is Redis. But Redis, in the end, requires if you have uh, if you have just simple data in Redis, you really you need to yeah you start duplicating data. You just start start uh, <coughs> maintaining lists or sets of uh, of keys that you use for reverse lookups. To, to other data structures to get back your data. It is quite fun in Redis, and I'll be happy to talk about that later, but it's just one example. If you only access similar data, like, for example, Dig or, or Reddit and, and Twitter does, use a column store, because it's, that's what they're really, really good at. And kind of amazing tools. I can only repeat that. They're kind of mind-boggling to me. And, well, ad hoc queries, I'm, I'm sorry, Lucene is not in here, but you could you could use Lucene for that, and you could use MongoDB because they are the only ones, basically apart from SimpleDB, which I excluded on purpose. Um, they're the only ones where you could do some sort of uh, ad hoc querying on your data, and 
it can can be a problem for uh, for some use cases, but so far not for mine, I gotta say. And you can use Neo4j again. You can use uh, something like RDF to to always query query your network of gra uh, of objects or, or documents. If you have tightly connected object graphs, obviously your only choice would be graph or object databases. But there is another choice for you, and it's called React. React has a. I already said that React is the only document database where you have a built-in way to store links between between your documents, and you can fetch them in one go. You don't have to. You don't have to go back to your database to uh, to fetch uh, link documents. You can all. You can get them with one request. Easy to scale out. Yeah, that's a good category because in some way or the other they all are. React, Cassandra, Volumar, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, because Scaling out is well. It's it's still somewhat a problem, but these tools somewhat made it easier. the f The final question: How do I know I'm not wasting my time with these tools? They're pretty new, I gotta say, and we're still lacking somewhat um, of the well production experience with with them in a on a wider range. But there are still solutions to real life problems. Cassandra, React, MongoDB. Um, they all ex they all were built out of the need out of a particular need that existed. Mostly uh, in w in some in one case or the other, it was a particular scaling need that forced them to simply uh, simplify their data model. But it's not that these tools haven't proven themselves in production. That is really not the case, and they're more of a natural evolution. And that is what I that is how I like to think of them. They're not they're not aiming to replace. They're aiming to accompany and. It's I like to tell people that they you know it's not about replacing uh, replacing the database they already have in use. It's not about throwing away your knowledge. It is about polyglot data storage. It is about choosing the right tool for a particular use case. Even if that use case means you have you have three uh, you have two or three different databases in your in your setup. It's not a bad idea in general. And well, personally, I I already do that. I use I use whichever database is, is right for which I whichever database I find to be right for a particular use case. If that is a different database, that is just fine with me. If it's good for the uh, if it's good for the purpose I'm after, it's just a it's just a better choice. The name is still kind of unfortunate, and I'm personally I'm not standing here trying to come with come up with a new one. It will probably stick around for a while until un uh, until someone we'll be able to come up with a new one. And with that, I'm done. <laughs> Any questions? There was a lot of stuff I know, and yeah, it is was just a basic intro. Definitely go to all the other talks, to the React, to CouchDB, and the Cassandra, and the MongoDB talks to get more details on all of these tools. Yeah. I personally have though the question is uh, if I can say anything about the usage of for example Cassandra in companies like Twitter or Facebook and I can't I haven't worked with Cassandra and Twitter. Twitter is kind of weird about what they're using because they love saying they're using new tools in the end you never know if they're already using Cassandra. Um Facebook has Cass uh, has had Cassandra in use for a long time and they built it. So that was the one of the particular needs uh, I was talking about, one of the particular real life needs. I'm not sure if and how they're still using it, but I can you know when I when I look at Cassandra and look at the co uh, at their data model, it's it's not hard to find a use case for that. So it's kind of it's kind of it's kind of different and it's very special. But I can tell you a lot of details. But probably when Eric Evans is going to be talking about Cassandra tomorrow, he will probably uh, be able to tell you a lot more. As for what what we're using, I'm using CouchDB and Redis in production myself, and so far we've had pretty good. Uh, pretty good experience with that. It's obviously y it's it's new territory, and somewhere in some edges is weird. For example, range queries in CatchGB, and but in the end, I'm very happy with it. And I'm using CatchGB on new projects, for example, and I just love playing around with the, uh, with these tools. They 
independent of who is using them in production because yeah, that's what the guys probably know best who wrote it. Anything else? Yes. Okay. In the are there well, how do you discover them? I could not I could probably not answer you that question because it's very specific to your user needs. But in the end and that's uh, that is what I was saying, schema less is kind of a weird term because in the end you will always migrate data. But you will just stop migrating migrating schemas, you will migrate data in uh, in ways that make more sense for you or for your access patterns. You know, it's you just don't you don't stop uh, moving around your data model just because you're using an, uh, a very flexible NoSQL database. You always have have areas where you where you push around data to be to be a lot more wel well suited for the access patterns. But obviously, you'd have to do that in somewhat of a migration step. You can just go ahead and write a new query for that. Well, you can, but you can in JavaScript, for example. But it is less ad hoc, definitely, than in a, a, an SQL query in this case. So that's definitely something to keep in mind about that and there's no universal answer around that but maybe if you know the demand for that increases who knows what's going to happen i don't know i can tell you the future time's up okay thanks again